Hello, uh, I'm Mike Vinsel, uh, and we're reading the illustra illustrated story of Stephen Stroh, and we just ended chapter six. So today, today is October 29th, 2023, and uh, so I just I just finished chapter six a couple minutes ago, but I'll go right, go right into chapter seven, and then chapter seven is harvest. Okay, so here is the picture. It goes along with that, and that's that also happens to be the, the cover picture, and that shows uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen with one of the Jamaican guys, and they are roasting apples. I don't know if you can see that, but maybe it's clear on this one. They're roasting apples over a fire, a campfire, and so we'll learn how that all goes. Okay, so chapter seven, Harvest. The Illustrated Story of Stephen Stroh by me, Michael D. Vinsel. The outdoor crew spent the next week distributing bins through e throughout each block. On Friday, that task would be completed. That Friday morning, Holmes, last day of work at, the, at Rock Mount Orchards, the whole crew got into the van. As, Drock, as Brock drove out of the driveway, Jesse announced to the crew, In keeping with the time-honored tradition of Rock Mount Orchards, Holmes is taking the outdoor crew out for breakfast at the chapel diner. Isn't that right, Holmes? Jesse said. I guess so, Holmes said. You know that tradition, Steve? Jesse asked. What tradition is that? The one where the guy quitting the crew has to buy everybody breakfast on his last day. Goes back, how many years? Jesse said, looking to Anton for the answer. As long as I can remember, it's been that way, Anton said. Over the previous few days, Jesse had convinced Holmes that it was his responsibility to uphold this tradition and to make sure he brought enough cash to pay for the breakfasts. Holmes had agreed to do this. He'd brought a hundred dollars, almost a week's pay. So Brock drove to the chapel diner. The crew ate heartily, stacks of pancakes, fried eggs, omelets, sausage patties, bacon, and bottomless cups of coffee. Brock pointed out that the waitress, a woman of perhaps 40, had had a wedding ring on when she first took the orders, and when, when she delivered the food, it was not there. You all catch that? Nobody else had noticed. Food for thought, Brock said. At the end of the meal, the bill came and Holmes paid it dutifully. Stephen alone contributed two dollars to the tip. Holmes even paid the rest of the tip. Holmes seemed cheerful. Stephen wasn't sure if maybe Holmes knew there was no such tradition but had just decided to play along, or maybe he really believed Jesse. Either way, there would be no good in telling him now, Stephen figured. The crew distributed the last of the bins at the Williams block on Abbott Hill. When that was done, they drank beer for the afternoon, Holmes' last day. That day, uh, the day Stephen had been looking forward to for so long arrived in late August. For the two weeks before this day, the outdoor crew had been picking Paula Reds. Stephen had learned exactly how, her, how hard that work is. As hard as he'd tried, he had never picked more than 50 bushels in a day. Rock Mount Orchards just kept one block of Paula Reds. They weren't a particularly good apple, Stephen thought. He thought about why they had kept them. After all, they had gotten rid of the Puritans as soon as those apples were deemed unprofitable. Stephen wondered how these Paula Reds could be profitable. It was true, perhaps, that they came to the farm stands before any of the other apples, but Stephen knew that farm stands were a small part of the market for a big, big orchard like Rockmount. Stephen thought about what Ted Castro had said that day when the crew had finished cleaning the bunkhouses. He'd said that the crew 
who would have the experience, yeah, that the crew would have the experience of picking apples themselves. The thought occurred to Stephen that Ted Castro might keep these trees for the express purpose of teaching empathy to the outdoor crew members. On the morning of his 28th day of, uh, um, on the morning of this 28th day of August, Ted Castro told the outdoor crew that the Jamaicans would arrive in the afternoon. Stephen felt the same kind of excitement he remembered as a child when his grandparents or Uncle Joe and the cousins would visit. For Stephen, visits from relatives were always happy occasions. He knew that this level of emotion was unusual. He tried to act like a normal person. But with the anticipation built up from the first time he'd heard about the Jamaicans back in winter, in the winter, meeting them would be very exciting. The outdoor crew finished picking the Paula Reds by 2.30 break. They got into the van, and Anton drove down the hill to the packing house. There, and there they were, the Jamaicans. The green-painted school bus that the orchard owned had arrived from Boston, and the Jamaicans were busily walking in and out of the bunkhouses. It must have been 90 degrees and sunny, but Stephen noticed that many of the Jamaicans wore ski hats. Some had great colorful knit hats as big as a shopping bag. Others were dressed in suits with white shirts and ties and neat hats like Stephen's grandfather had worn. Ted Castro walked up, the va up to the van and, and, and instructed the crew that for the rest of the day, your job is to introduce yourselves to the Jamaicans, memorize their names, and get to know them. Anton, Brock, and George already knew most of the men, but for the rest of the crew, it was their first time to meet anybody from Jamaica. Anton had taken Stephen under his wing from Stephen's first day back in January. This day, he took Stephen to the, into the bunkhouse to introduce him to a group of men who'd been coming to the orchard for more than 10 years. Anton told Stephen that he himself had been a boy when he'd first met these men. He and Stephen walked into the second bunkhouse to where this group stayed every year. Anton turned to Stephen and said, Stephen Stroh, this is Stedman Johnson. Stedman Johnson? This is Stephen Stroh. Mr. Johnson extended his hand in greeting. Stephen shook it. Nice to meet you, Mr. Johnson, he said. Likewise, Steve, Mr. Stephen Stroh, Johnson said. Then Anton gestured to another man who looked up, uh, who looked up from um, who looked up from unpacking his, uh, from unpacking to address the greeting. Stephen Stroh, this is Altamont Powell. Altamont Powell, this is Stephen Stroh. Ah, Stevie Mon, it is nice to meet such a fine young man as you. Somehow I knew that fortune would smile upon me today, and lo, it has, Mr. said Mr. Powell. Nice to meet you, to, you know, nice to meet you, Mr. Powell, Stephen said. He'd never heard such a funny greeting before. Anton turned to the next man, tall, muscular, wearing a black baseball cap with a yellow caterpillar bulldozer company logo on it. The, a toothpick pointed out from the corner of his broad smile as Stephen, uh, as Anton introduced Stephen. Stephen Stroh, this is Beresford McPherson. Beresford Mc, McPherson, this is Stephen Stroh. Nice to meet you, Stephen. Yes, mom. Call me Mackie, McPherson said. Nice to meet you, Mackie. I'm looking forward to learning about Jamaica, Stephen said. Ah, Stevie Mon. Do you know about Jamaica? Uh, asked Mackie. Well, I know Bob Marley music, and I know the capital is Kingston. You know Kingston. I am Kingston. Uh, yes, it will be a good season to work with such a scholarly young man as you, said Mackie. Anton dismissed himself and left Stephen to make his way among the re uh, make his way meeting the rest of the men on his own. Stephen made a point of memorizing their names. He even wrote them down on a scrap of paper that he would study in the coming night, coming nights. That night at home, before he went to sleep, he looked at the list and remembered who each name was. For some reason he didn't know, 
As soon as he looked at the names on the paper, he could see each man's face in his mind. He remembered Mr. Johnson. The others had said he was a he is preacher Johnson. In Jamaica, he had been a, priest, a preacher, a Protestant preacher. Stephen supposed that, uh, that he was here on the apple-picking crew as a chaplain might be in the army. Stedman Johnson had shown Stephen a picture of his daughter who worked in the Spanish Town police station. Even hearing the name Spanish Town set Stephen's mind want to wondering why a town in Jamaica would have such a name. Stephen looked forward to getting to know Preacher Johnson. Altamont Powell, what a cheerful man he was. He had curly gray, uh, he had curly gray crew cut hair, but his face did not betray his age. Stephen would have guessed maybe mid fifties, maybe 60 tops. Stephen would be pro surprised later to find that Altamont Powell was 72 years old. He later found out that Stedman Johnson was 70 and Mackey was 67. Stephen had no idea that people so old could be in such good shape. Beresford McPherson always had an enthusiastic grin with the toothpick always sticking out from between his teeth. He looked to be six feet four, maybe more. He was lean and muscular, very kind, but something about him suggested an inner toughness that Stephen detected, but knew nothing about. But work was scarce in Jamaica, so he also picked apples. He had seven, st seven children and 15 grandchildren in Jamaica so far, he told, he told Stephen. Altamont Powell was also a grandfather of many children. He'd asked Stephen if he was married. Stephen had told him he wasn't. Stephen remembered when Stedman Johnson had introduced Pick Pixley Wilson. Stevie Mon, this is Pixley Wilson. Pixley Wilson, this is Stephen Stroh, Mr. Johnson said. Nice to, miss nice to meet you, Mr. Stephen, Mr. Wilson had answered. Nice to meet you, too. Please call me Steve. Okay, Stevie Mon. Pixley Wilson answered, startling St Stephen with his enthusiasm. Stephen noticed that all of their names were from the English language, but they were different from American names in a way that Stephen couldn't understand. In the days to come, he would meet such men as Neville Jarrett, Wilson Beauville, Vincent Porteous, George Montague, Constantine Leith, and George Burke. The following Monday, Stephen got up at five o'clock. He made coffee for his thermos and salami sandwiches for lunch. He cooked two fried eggs and made toast for his breakfast. He packed his lunch, filled his thermos, gulped down the rest of his coffee, and ate his breakfast in the kitchen of his parents' house. He would have to move out soon, he reminded himself. He also knew that he would never be able to support himself by working at the orchard, but for the time being he decided not to worry about that. Up on his bicycle, Stephen went into his glide down Filbert Hill in the darkness. When he arrived at the orchard at the bunkhouse, uh, at the orchard, the bunkhouse windows glowed yellow in the darkness. He had heard you know, he heard the voices of the Jamaicans inside, talking with such thick accents that he could hardly understand a word. Uh, when they talked to Stephen, he could understand them perfectly. He went, he went into the bunkhouse, to, the kitchen, to greet the Jamaicans. Mackie and Stedman Johnson were cooking chicken and fried dumplings for lunch for all the Jamaicans. A delicious, spicy aroma filled the air. Stephen knew the smell of curry. This was similar, but not the same. There was some spice in that chicken that Stephen had never smelled before. Good morning, Stevie Mon. It is, a good, it is good to see you on this beautiful day. Mackie said. Good morning, Mackie. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Wow, that chicken smells great, Stephen said. We have plenty chicken and plenty dumpling. Let me make lunch for you, Mackie said. Oh, I have a lunch. Yeah, I'm okay, Stephen said. Then you must join us for supper tonight. You must taste Jamaican chicken and, and, and peas and rice, Stedman Johnson said. Yes, Stephen Mon, you will be home late tonight. Come join us for dinner, Mackie said. Oh, thank you. I look forward to that very much. 
I'll be here, Stephen said. Yes, Ma, Mackie said with great cheer. Well, I better get down to the packing house. See you tonight, Stephen said. Ah, see you today. We're on your crew, Mackie said. At the packing house, with the crew assembled, Ted Castro told Stephen that he would be yarding out for Anton's crew. What's yarding out? Stephen asked Anton. Well, you're on the Ford 2000 with the forks. Your job is to generally facilitate the work of the Jamaicans, so to speak, Anton said. Stephen was not sure, exactly sure what that meant. Ted Castro gave everybody their instructions for the day, and they all left to do, to do their jobs. Stephen and Anton walked out to where the, where the tractors were parked. So what exactly does facilitate entail, Stephen asked while they walked. Well, Anton explained, it entails making sure that making sure that uh, there are bins next to the first few trees in each row so the Jamaicans can start right away when they get there. When they fill a bin, I mark it with this, with this a red construction crayon. Uh, that's the sign for you to take it away. You line them up on a flat spot for Brock or Jesse to take them away with the bin master. Sounds pretty straightforward, Stephen said. Anton continued. Also, if a guy has finished his tree and the bin isn't full, he'll holler. He'll holler for you to move it up to the next tree. Sounds easy enough, Stephen said. Don't worry, you'll be fine. We work until sunset. After that, you have to make sure all the bins have been brought down to the loading area, Anton said. Then he softened his tone. No doubt about it, harvest is the hardest time of the year. The one thing is that once start harvest starts, please don't quit. It is tough work, but you got to tough it out until the harvest is over. Stephen thought about what Anton said. It made sense. It certainly would be a problem if, if he didn't show up uh, someday. He promised Anton that he wouldn't quit. Anton continued his lecture. By the middle of September, it gets pretty cold at night. In the mornings, the apples are like blocks of ice. The Jamaicans don't wear gloves while picking, so their hands get cold. Somebody has to go to the blocks about an hour before everybody else and build fires along the rows enough to last until like 10 o'clock. After that, It'll be warm enough. Okay. Uh, after that, it'll be uh, just a second. Where we were? Yeah. After that, it'll be warm enough. Whoever does that gets an extra hour of pay each day. You you up for that? Stephen asked. I mean, he asked Stephen. Stephen imagined the grapes along Center Road. If he went early, he could pick some of those grapes and eat them with his coffee after he'd finished making those fires. He'd be able to watch the sun rise before everybody else arrived. I'll do that. I'll take on fire duty, Stephen said. Okay, this is a good place to take a break. Okay, we're in the middle of chapter seven, The Harvest.